Hello. This is John T. Rhapsody's Esquire, purveyor of awesome old-school audio stories. I bring you today a tall tale we'll call Baron Munchausen's Travels to Sri Lanka, the first of many tales from the book titled The Surprising Adventures of Baron Munchausen by Rudolf Eric Raspa, published in 1785. Raspa walked the earth from 1736 to 1794, mostly in Germany. He was a librarian and a writer, and is best known for his collection of tall tales based loosely on a real German baron named Hieronymus Karl Friedrich Freiherr von Munchausen, who fought on the Russian side in the Russo-Turkish War from 1735 to 1739. The real Baron Munchausen was eccentric and was known for telling tall tales, earning the nickname the Lugan Baron or the Baron of Lies. If you like awesome old school audio stories from old minds that were once young minds, brought to you free of charge and with a grateful heart, consider while listening to subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications to get notice of new stories. Some funny, some spooky, others somewhere in between, and all awesome. Usually at least once a week. These simple acts will help this channel immensely. And now, hear the words of old. Baron Munchausen's Travels to Sri Lanka from the surprising adventures of Baron Munchausen from 1785 by Rudolf Eric Raspa. What follows is an account by Baron Munchausen regarding his first travels given to a group of friends over a bottle. Some years before my beard announced approaching manhood, or, in other words, when I was neither man nor boy, but between both, I expressed in repeated conversations a strong desire of seeing the world, from which I was discouraged by my parents, though my father had been no inconsiderable traveller himself, as will appear before I have reached the end of my singular and, I may add, interesting adventures. A cousin, by my mother's side, took a liking to me, and often said I was a fine forward youth, and was much inclined to satisfy my curiosity. His eloquence had more effect than mine, for my father consented to my accompanying him in a voyage to the island of Ceylon, later known as Sri Lanka, where his uncle had resided as governor for many years. We sailed from Amsterdam with dispatches from their high mightinesses, the States of Holland. The only circumstance which happened on our voyage worth relating was the wonderful effects of a storm, which had torn up by the roots a great number of trees of enormous bulk and height in an island where we lay at anchor to take in wood and water. Some of these trees weighed many tons, yet they were carried by the wind so amazingly high that they appeared like the feathers of small birds floating in the air, for they were at least five miles above the earth. However, as soon as the storm subsided, they all fell perpendicularly into their respective places, and took root again, except the largest, which happened when it was blown into the air, to have a man and his wife, a very honest old couple, upon its branches, gathering cucumbers. In this part of the globe, that useful vegetable grows upon trees, you know. The weight of this couple, as the tree descended, overbalanced the trunk, and brought it down in a horizontal position. It fell upon the chief man of the island, and killed him on the spot. He had quitted his house in the storm, under an apprehension of its falling upon him, and was returning through his own garden 
when this fortunate accident happened. The word fortunate here requires some explanation. This chief was a man of a very avaricious and oppressive disposition, and though he had no family, the natives of the island were half-starved by his oppressive and infamous impositions. The very goods which he had thus taken from them were spoiling in his stores, while the poor wretches from whom they were plundered were pining in poverty. Though the destruction of this tyrant was accidental, the people chose the cucumber gatherers for their governors, as a mark of their gratitude for destroying, though accidentally, their late tyrant. After we had repaired the damages we sustained in this remarkable storm, and taken leave of the new governor and his lady, we sailed with a fair wind for the object of our voyage. In about six weeks we arrived at Sri Lanka, where we were received with great marks of friendship and true politeness. The following singular adventures may not prove unentertaining. After we had resided at Sri Lanka about a fortnight, I accompanied one of the governor's brothers upon a shooting party. He was a strong athletic man, and being used to that climate, for he had resided there some years, he bore the violent heat of the sun much better than I could. In our excursion, he had made a considerable progress through a thick wood when I was only at the entrance. Near the banks of a large body of water, which had engaged my attention, I thought I heard a rustling noise behind me. Upon turning around, I was almost petrified, as who would not be, at the sight of a lion, which was evidently approaching with the intention of satisfying his appetite with my poor carcass, and that without asking my consent. What was to be done in this horrible dilemma? I had not even a moment for reflection. My shotgun was only charged with swan shot, and I had no other ammunition about me. However, though I had little chance of killing such an animal with that weak kind of ammunition, I had some hopes of frightening him by the loud report from the firearm, and perhaps of wounding him also. I immediately let fly and fired, without waiting till he was within reach, and the report did nothing but enrage him, for he now quickened his pace and seemed to approach me full speed. I attempted to escape, but that only added, if an addition could be made, to my distress. For the moment I turned about, I found a large crocodile, with his mouth extended almost ready to receive me. On my right hand was the body of water before mentioned, and on my left was a deep precipice, said to have, as I have since learned, a receptacle at the bottom for venomous creatures. In short, I gave myself up as lost, for the lion was now upon his hind legs just in the act of seizing me. I fell involuntarily to the ground with fear, and, as it afterwards appeared, he sprang over me. I lay some time in a situation which no language can describe, expecting to feel his teeth or talons in some part of me every moment. After waiting in this prostrate situation a few seconds, I heard a violent but unusual noise, different from any sound that had ever before assailed my ears. Nor is it at all to be wondered at when I inform you from whence it proceeded. After listening for some time, I ventured to raise my head and look round, when, to my unspeakable joy, I perceived the lion had, by the eagerness with which he sprung at me, jumped forward, as I fell, into the crocodile's mouth, 
which, as before observed, was wide open. The head of the lion stuck in the throat of the crocodile, and they were struggling to extricate themselves. I fortunately recollected my hunting knife, which was by my side. With this instrument I severed the lion's head at one blow, and the body fell at my feet. I then, with the butt end of my shotgun, rammed the lion's head farther into the throat of the crocodile, and destroyed the crocodile by suffocation, for he could neither swallow nor eject it. Soon after I had thus gained a complete victory over my two powerful adversaries, my companion arrived in search of me. For finding I did not follow him into the wood, he returned, apprehending I had lost my way, or met with some accident. After mutual congratulations, we measured the crocodile, which was just forty feet in length. As soon as we related this extraordinary adventure to the governor, he sent a wagon and servants who brought home the two carcasses. The lion skin was properly preserved with its hair on, after which it was made into tobacco pouches, and presented by me upon our return to Holland to the Burgomasters, who, in return, requested my acceptance of a thousand ducats. The skin of the crocodile was stuffed in the usual manner, and makes a capital article in their public museum at Amsterdam, where the exhibitor relates the whole story to each spectator with such additions as he thinks proper. Some of his variations are rather extravagant. One of them is that the lion jumped quite through the crocodile and was making his escape at the back door when, as soon as his head appeared, Monsieur the Great Baron, as he is pleased to call me, cut it off, and three feet of the crocodile's tail along with it. Nay, so little attention has the museum exhibitor to the truth, that he sometimes adds, as soon as the crocodile missed his tail, it turned about, snatched the hunting knife out of Monsieur the Great Baron's hand, and swallowed it with such eagerness that it pierced his heart and killed him immediately. The little regard which this impudent knave has to veracity makes me sometimes apprehensive that my real facts may fall under suspicion by being found in company with his confounded inventions. And that concludes the tale of Baron Munchausen's travels to Sri Lanka, from 1785 by Rudolf Eric Rasper. This is John T. Rhapsody's Esquire, purveyor of awesome old-school audio stories. Thank you for listening. You can hear more stories like this in the channel's playlists. Find them by staying tuned for the last 20 seconds of this video and clicking on the end screen icons. You can also go to the channel homepage and click on the playlist tab. If you enjoyed this story and would like to hear more, please download the YouTube app, create an account, subscribe to this channel, like this video by clicking on the thumbs up icon, leave your comments, click the notification bell, and share the videos with your friends so that they too can hear the words of old.